Good morning. I'm very privileged. This is an honor to be here today. Thank you for listening to me. I'm here to speak to you about women in academic medicine. I don't have any disclosures, except I am a woman. <laughs> and I don't claim to speak for all women. So in the early 70s, less than 10% of medical students were women. And here's a picture of the UW intern class of 1974. Thank you, Dr. Sarawitz, for sharing this. You can see her quite prominently in the front row. <laughs> and look how times have changed. This is the intern class of 2016. In July, smiling, looking pretty fresh. <laughs> So for the past 20 years, about half of medical students have been women, but the proportion of women starts to drop as you go up in increasing academic rank. In fact, there are more mustaches than women in our medical leadership today. <laughs> this is true, peer evaluated in an evidence-based medical journal. <laughs> So in 2015, a group actually examined the leadership composition of 20 different specialties across 50 of the top NIH-funded medical schools. They calculated what they called a mustache index, which is the proportion of women in medical leadership positions, and they characterized that as mostly department chairs, compared to the number of mustachioed people in those same positions. So women accounted for 13% of department leaders. Mustachioed individuals? 19%. And all of the mustaches were on men. <laughs> so it led the authors to conclude that mustaches are rare, but women in leadership are rarer. So while the numbers of women who have been applying to medical school has been steadily increasing, the proportion of women in medical school has actually been decreasing since 2003. We peaked at 51% then, and then now we've been in the high 40 percentile. There has been near-sex parity in medical school since the 1990s. But despite graduating and completing residency at pretty similar numbers, we're only making up 38% of full-time faculty, 21% of full professors, and only hold 15% of department chair and deaconal positions. So if we look at academic physicians who are all on roster in 2014, we can look back and then divide it into three separate cohorts based on when they graduated from residency, 1980, 1990, and the year 2000. So after adjusting for their individual specialties, their age, their years in rank, a number of productivity factors like NIH funding, number of publications, whether they were first author, last author, their medical school rank, um, how much research money their institution received, there were a number of factors adjusted. Still, across all cohorts, women are significantly less likely to be professors as compared to men. So in the group graduating in 1980, less than half of them have achieved full professor, whereas over 60% of men have. That's over a 34-year career in women who have chosen to enter academics. We can already see significant trends starting to emerge in the group graduating in the year 2000. Almost 7% of men are professors and 3% of women. So how does UW compare to these numbers? So here we see the percent of full-time faculty at each rank. The blue lines, those represent a conglomeration of all the medical specialties nationally. So the green bars represent the percent of women nationally in internal medicine specifically, and the purple bars are our Department of Medicine. So we're doing better than the national average. We do have a culture that's promoting women better than average. But we have to acknowledge that overall, these numbers are still low, and we have a lot of work to do. So moving up in rank, how about clinical department chairs? So two of our 18 chairs are women, and that's about 11%. Our department chair and our dean are also men. I calculated our mustache index, and it's 0 0.7. <laughs> There's a well-documented pay gap, and it's largest for those with advanced degrees, and particularly in med medicine. So I just want to step back and say that I want to take a moment and acknowledge both our school and our leadership's commitment to gender equity and pay. And the reason that I'm not showing you the numbers for men and women faculty in our Department of Medicine and School of Medicine is that we don't have discrepancy in our base salary per rank. And that's because our leaders have been committed to that, 
They review it annually, and that's very impressive, and thank you for doing that. The gender pay gap is highest in cities, and many of you likely saw this article in the Seattle Times touting that Seattle has one of the greatest gender wage gaps for physicians. Women earn fewer NIH grants, and the ones that we get are worth less. So the advancement path has been called a pipeline, and many people say that the pipeline is just slow, that it, by nature there has to be a number of years before the historically all-male classes will graduate and wash out of the senior leadership ranks. But I would challenge that this has been completely disproven by those specialties that have been dominated by women for over 25 years. In obstetrics and gynecology and in pediatrics, women only hold about 20% of department chair positions. So is our pipeline leaky? Are we losing women along the way, dropping out because they're not supported? Or is it a glass ceiling, an invisible barrier that we cannot get past? I think that it's both. So if I identified three major themes that I would like to talk to you about today, about the issues I think women face in advancement, what I've labeled the critical period, career development, and bias. So my focus within each of these will be relatively narrow. I think it is absolutely impossible to try to talk about all of the things that are important in 45 minutes or less. So my goal is instead just to share some new ideas, some new models for change. Some of them are more provocative than others. Probably make you a little bit uncomfortable. Definitely make myself uncomfortable. But ultimately, what I really want you to do is to start thinking and engaging in open dialogue about some of these issues and talk to your colleagues after you leave today. So in developmental biology, a critical period is a maturational stage in an organism's life cycle. And it's a time at which the nervous system is particularly vulnerable or sensitive to external stimuli from the environment. And without that stimuli, they may not develop critical skills so some examples for that are language acquisition and visual processing development. So a major issue for medicine and for women is that there are two critical periods that can happen at the same time. So women tend to delay childbirth and child rearing until after they finish residency. It's a time with rigorous long work hours, a relatively inflexible schedule. So then for women wishing to have children, their 30s are characterized by two critical time periods our fertility, the biological clock. And then also it's the early stages of our career development and productivity and accomplishments are critical. This is the academic clock. So despite important changes over the last few years, evolving gender roles, evolving family roles, the truth is still that women are doing the bulk of childcare and housework at home in our employed US population. So I had to ask, is that still true of women in medicine? So I've highlighted here, these are results from a survey of 1,500 NIH K08 or K23 award recipients. So this is undoubtedly a highly motivated, career-oriented, and highly achieving cohort. So the graph outlines the median time that they reported spending in hours on the various activities, which have been divided into teaching, clinical care, research, other paid labor, which is related to work, and domestic labor which is housework, elder care, and child care. So the results are stratified by gender and then whether or not their partner was employed. So EP stands for employed partner. So the results are pretty striking, I think. Mothers are responsible for many more hours of home care each week. And they're trying to balance this extra time by doing fewer hours of research accordingly as compared to men. Whether or not the partners were employed actually had no impact in the amount of time that they were spending in childcare or housework, and they had similar reductions in their research time. Men spent fewer hours on domestic care overall, and having an employed partner for men actually only resulted in a very small increase in the amount of housework and childcare that was done, and no effect on the time that was spent in research. So what's the bottom line? They calculated that mothers were spending about eight and a half hours more per week on parenting and domestic tasks and three hours less on research. So why is research preferentially reduced out of all the different activities in the day? And I've made a hypothesis that's not based on the study, but it's based on my reading from 
focus groups, narratives, and linguistic analysis and qualitative analysis of why women have chosen uh, to make the sacrifices that they have. And I think the psychology is really interesting. So when faced with having to reduce some hour out of the day in the workday to accommodate more hours of work later in the day at home, women have decided to preferentially reduce their time in research because that is the one thing that will not affect other people. If you reduce your mentoring time, trainees can suffer. If you reduce your teaching time, somebody might need to fill in. If you reduce your clinical time, same thing, that work will fall to a colleague. But if you reduce research, you are the one that will be affected. And specifically, in a way that can directly affect your advancement because of the way that we weight our promotions. So the same is seen in academic uh, faculty and non-research tracks. This was a very similar study design. It was also survey-based. The results this time are stratified by academic rank and gender. We have instructors, assistant professors, and associate professors. The pale blue boxes are showing us the separate groups here. So if you look at each individual faculty rank, I want to draw your eye to the orange boxes and also the blue boxes. Here they've differentiated between housework, and domestic care, which is elder and child care. So pretty similarly, we're seeing that women are spending more hours in child care and less time in research. The biggest discrepancy in research time is at the associate level professor, the associate professor level. So is that a possible reason that women aren't making it to full professor as often? Is it this discrepancy because of increased time spent in child care and thus reduced research productivity? <laughs> So better work-life integration is critical for all of our physicians. I think our burnout numbers are telling us that we have a problem with our work-life balance. But for mothers, I want to point out, these incremental reductions can dramatically affect your productivity in a strategic way where productivity is at a premium. So parenthood clearly affects the career trajectory of women. Faculty mothers have the lowest tenure rates compared to fathers and childless women. They have higher rates of entry into non-tenured tracks, and they're much more likely to work part-time if there's increased needs for child care or elder care, whereas men most commonly work part-time to accommodate other professional responsibilities. So fathers of children, on the other hand, actually benefit from having kids. They're the most likely to secure a tenure-tracked position. In the business world, they're more likely to be hired, and they usually have a pay raise around the time that they have children, whereas women are paid less. So this is attributed to what's called the ideal worker phenomenon, and it's based in an old gender stereotype, where as soon as a man has a child, then the assumption is that now there's a family at home, and they require income. And so this is going to be a very dependable worker. He cannot afford to lose the job. It also assumes that there's a caregiver at home who's able to provide that child care. And so that worker is free to work long hours and be very highly productive, and that's highly valued. But that's translated into how we have interpreted our view of mothers and of fathers. So the results of this paper were pretty hot news when they came out. It was presented at the Society of Labor Economists in 2015. And it's based on a sample size of over 20,000 highly educated workers. So these were PhDs working in academics. So the productivity output was measured as an index of publications over a person's career. So we're looking just at women here. And the blue line is women without children. The red line is if you had one child. And the green line is if you had two or more children. And yes, mothers did show a decrease in productivity that coincided with their childbearing. But here is the catch, that mothers aren't actually less productive. The key is the distribution of their productivity. So productivity recovered to hit a second peak later in their life. And the kicker is that the total career productivity of mothers is no different than that of men. And actually, if a woman had more than two, uh, two or more children, they were more productive than men on average. So a separate study looked at a cohort of physician mothers over about 17 years. They found that mothers who took leave or went part-time, that those gaps were associated with major reductions in salary compared to those uh, who didn't take leave. So maybe they thought this could be due to reduced subsequent effort, and then you have lost opportunities for advancement, 
and then lost salary related to that advancement. But they overall concluded that they felt that the magnitude of that loss was out of proportion for opportunity cost. So I think mothers are being penalized on two fronts. They do become less productive in the measures that our current system uses at a time for advancement uh, when time limit demands productivity. But what is more damaging, I think, is this perception that that pattern is going to continue. The motherhood penalty is uh, incurred because of the assumed loss. There's disproportionate pay reductions after leave or an FTE reduction. There's less career mentoring for women who go part-time. That ultimately can result in lower career satisfaction and then a sense of institutional neglect. And I think those are major contributors to pipeline leak. <coughs> So in the words of Michelle Obama, no country can ever truly flourish if it stifles the potential of its women and deprives itself of the contributions of half of its citizens. So how do we better support our working mothers? Flexible work, paid parental leave, on-site childcare, subsidizing needs for care disruptions at the last minute, those are critical parts of the conversation. But it's actually not where I'm gonna focus today. I think we need to be a little bit more innovative and a little bit more creative. And instead, I suggest that we need to revise what our institutional <coughs> and our professional expectations are for how a normative career is expected to progress. We need to ask, does our six-year limit actually still make sense? So the business world is also completely restructuring. They're trying to attract and retain an evolving workforce that highly values work-life integration. <laughs> So the corporate ladder is out, and the corporate lattice is in. It completely abandons this upper-out mentality that is inherent to the ladder. It supports horizontal and vertical movements. It encourages people to vary their workloads and their responsibilities over the course of their careers when their individual responsibilities or family responsibilities may be evolving. Employees can accelerate or decelerate their career paths at any point in time, and the key is that it doesn't take them off the path to advancement. It can change the way that we think about career growth, the way that we think about success, and it builds in better flexibility systems, which I think can benefit everybody in our workforce. Hence, a rising tide can lift all boats. But what could this possibly look like for academic medicine? So we have a model a group of women at Stanford devised the Academic Biomedical Career Customization Program, and this was piloted in 2014, and it's formed as a career lattice. So faculty received professional career counseling so that they could identify both their short and long-term goals, and also help them recognize at what points in their life might they have competing or increased family responsibilities or different personal interests that would require flexibility in their work. So they then created a customized career path with the help of their department chairs and their division heads. They decided whether they would scale up or scale down based across four dimensions. So one was the pace or the rate of promotion. Two was workload, full-time, part-time, what is your FTE? And then this was disaggregated into clinical, research, administrative, and teaching tasks. They decided whether their schedule needed to be predictable or if it could be unpredictable. And then their desired versus their planned role. Are they functioning as an individual member or are they aiming to be a member of leadership? They set benchmarks and there were regular check-ins. What is so innovative about this plan is that they completely revalued the way that work was seen. So they created a banking system. So departments self-identified a list of tasks that they felt could earn credit. And these usually were things that weren't already compensated or they were felt they were being under-recognized. So some of the things that you could earn credit for were filling in for a colleague for last-minute disruptions or if you were serving on an inst institutional service committee. So then faculty tracked the hours that they were spending in these non-research activities. And as the hours accumulated, it earned them credit that they could then redeem later on to offload either a work-work or a work-life conflict. So some of the examples for that, you could get assistance with uh, writing revision, with PowerPoint editing and design, with presentation skills. What I think is so innovative is that you could also redeem points 
for help at home. You could get meal delivery. You could get errand outsourcing, car services. You could get subsidized child care or elder care. Freeing up faculty to do work that they were trained and qualified to do and also helping them prioritize the things that they wanted to do. So then the question is, well, maybe we need to think earlier. Should we decompress this critical period and instead focus on our training programs and try to give more flexibility there? Our current model of medical training really hasn't left much room for our evolving workforce. The American Board of Surgery, I thought surprisingly, is the one regulatory board that offers a flexible training plan. It's called five and six and allows trainees to spend what they normally would in five years, do it in six years. So it gives an additional 12 months of flex time that they can divvy out and use as they choose. It does require pre-approval both from the board and the institution with which they matched. And the reimbursement for those additional 12 flex months is left up to the institution. So then the question arises, how could this banking system and how could subsidizing flexible career paths for residents actually make sense financially at a time where everybody is in a time crunch? So I did some math. So if we instead look at the intermediate term or the long-term value of our workers and our mothers, we should place a premium on retaining good doctors. So the cost of physician turnover is unbelievable. There's direct cost, like print and online advertising, that can add up to $35,000. There's additional soft cost, recruiters fees, lost productivity time for the employees who might be involved in the selection process. There's onboarding costs. And then you have to factor in what's the loss in revenue of the physician who left, and there's always a ramp up time for the new physician who it takes over when they're eventually hired. And ultimately, from the numbers that I saw, this can add up to over $400,000 for one physician turnover. This is really impressive. If we focus on reducing turnover and retaining workers, building institutional loyalty, I think that's how we can implement these flexibility systems. So you can support, money, uh, you can support mothers with money to leverage extra resources also during this critical period. There's a number of institutions that do provide additional monetary support to women with children or to men and women who may have increased family responsibilities that could directly impact their work productivity. MGH has the Claflin Award, which is awarding five women with children each year with $100,000. And the key here is that I think that it's money well spent. We can't afford to lose half of our population in science. So my summary for you today is that I've presented several models and ways that we could better support mothers, support their productivity, and revalue workers' contributions to a system as a whole. I think we need to revise how we think about our career trajectories and move away from a linear model into a lattice framework. I think we also need to expand how we're thinking about our training programs and be a lot more innovative than we have been. So I'd like to take a few moments now to focus on career development, and I have a very narrow focus here. I think we have a really unique opportunity at UW to develop a program that does not exist anywhere in academic medicine. So a Catalyst survey a couple of years ago discovered that women who are graduating from top MBA programs were getting lower level management positions, lower salaries, and had less career satisfaction than their male counterparts. The only difference that they could find between the men and the women when they adjusted for a lot of different factors was that women more, were more likely to have a mentor, but beyond that, they were more likely to have a lot of mentors. So what gives? So the difference is that the mentors for the women had less organizational clout. They were occupying lower tiers of the hierarchy. And the more senior the mentor, the faster the mentee's career could advance. So I think what was accounting for the women's career stall was not a lack of push, but it was a lack of pull. Mentoring is absolutely necessary, but it is not sufficient. What men had were sponsors they were twice as likely to have a sponsor as compared to a woman in the MBA survey. Sponsorship specifically refers to advocacy that is done by a person in a position of power where they can leverage their influence to gain opportunities to give to junior faculty members. 
So the key ingredient here is capital. You have to be able to have the influence to actually leverage it to get that opportunity. It's higher stakes than mentoring. You have to put your reputation on the line and vouch for somebody that you think is going to do a good job at the challenge that you're setting. So sponsorship is critical to the advancement of all young professionals, and it increases all important measures about corporate success. People with sponsors are more likely to get salary increases, and specifically, women with sponsors are more likely to ask for a raise and are more likely to ask for stretch assignments. Sheryl Sandberg, the author of Lean In, she developed strong sponsorship experiences. She absolutely earned her sponsorship through her talent and her brilliance. But as an undergraduate at Harvard, she garnered the attention of Larry Summers. When he left for the World Bank, he leveraged his position to get her a job as a research assistant. And then when he, when he was tapped for the US Treasury, he again levered his position and brought her on as chief of staff. So she absolutely earned her sponsorship, but we need to acknowledge that we all need powerful people to help us advance. So the same is true in medicine. Women are under-sponsored here too. In a survey of NIH, K08, and K23 grant recipients, the following questions were asked. Has a senior advocate invited you to serve as an oral discussant or a panelist at a national meeting? More men than women responded yes. Has a senior advocate invited you to serve on a national committee, including study section or a grant review panel? More men than women. Has a senior advocate invited you to write an editorial? More men than women. Has a senior advocate invited you to serve on an editorial board? More men than women. So I think I've made a point. So this graph depicts the unadjusted percentages of men and women who reported having all of those experiences here, and it's broken down into gender dyads. This is the part of the figure that I want you to look at. This is binary composites of whether or not somebody answered yes or no to any of those questions. And the bottom line is that men had more sponsorship experiences overall, and that women were receiving less sponsorship from both male and female senior mentors. This can clearly contribute to a lag in the promotion if women are missing out on critical opportunities to shine in the spotlight. So my conclusions for this is I have a couple of challenges for us. I think we should make sponsorship an organizational strategy for advancement of all of our workers, but especially women. We should be teaching and educating junior faculty what is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Can we have more department meet and greets and set up more interactions for junior faculty and the senior faculty to make these connections? Could we create a referral rec rec uh, network for sponsorship? We reward mentorship. Maybe we should have a sponsorship award. At the individual level, I would challenge each of you to think about what opportunities can you leverage could you be a sponsor? If so, give those opportunities to both women and men. And then if you're at the junior level, find yourself a sponsor. So now we're going to spend a few minutes talking about our last topic, bias. Why are women paid less than men? Even when adjusting for all of the different hypotheses for why there could be a pay differential, specialty, academic rank, and their years in rank, their tenure track, their age, how long it's been since residency, their activity distribution in FTE, NIH funding, clinical trial participation, publication count, where their name came in the publication order, even Medicare reimbursements, medical school rank, I think you get the picture. So several groups have come up with pretty similar numbers. And they've estimated that about 40% of the gender pay gap cannot be explained by these individual factors. So in 2006, the National Academy of Sciences launched an official investigation to figure out why women were not advancing in the ranks of science, mathematics, technology, engineering, and medicine. They completely rejected the idea that women were not advancing because they weren't entering these fields or that there was a lack of commitment by women to their career. Instead, they concluded 
that the most significant barrier to women's advancement is systematic gender bias. So I want to acknowledge that we have come an amazingly long way. Explicit discrimination and bias are much less common and they're not tolerated. But this means that now we can focus on much more deeply embedded issues that are entrenched and much more difficult to fix. Implicit bias is insidious. It's by definition unrecognized by the beholder. And it can, and it most often does, directly conflicts with your outwardly stating beliefs or principles. So here's the key, is that we all have it and we're not bad people. So critical to understanding implicit bias is that no one is exempt. This is not a unidirectional force that is perpetrated by one group onto another. This is the direct result of a complex interplay of cultural and societal factors of learned associations and standardized behaviors. So we all think this way, men and women both. It will take the entire community in medicine to recognize this, acknowledge this, and then actually mobilize to combat its threats to equity. So the effects of bias were shown all too clearly in this experiment that many of you have probably heard of at this point. So a group of researchers set out to determine what are the effects of gender bias in science faculty at highly rated research institutions. These are highly educated individuals. So faculty were told that they were going to be provided with the CV of a potential job applicant who wanted a job as a lab manager. They were going to give their assessment of the person's competency based off of their CV, whether or not they were worthy of being hired, provide a suggested starting salary, and then also offer career mentorship experiences. But the key was some of the CVs had a woman's name at the top and others had a man's name. Otherwise, we're identical. So despite the identical CV, both male and female faculty consistently rated the man as significantly more competent, more worthy of being hired, offered an average of $11,000 higher starting salary, and outlined more mentoring opportunities for them. This is a major problem. So bias exists in all of us. This is what we call the glass ceiling. It's the invisible barrier. But with the evolving understanding of what actually constitutes and underlies implicit bias, we're finding new ways to measure it, and we're starting to see some color in the glass. So the basis of gender bias is gender schemas. So what is a schema? The schema is an unconscious hypothesis about gender differences, and the key here is that it then distorts perceptions. I think of this as a fancy way of talking about stereotypes, and I will use the two terms interchangeably, but there are subtle differences. It's a form of heuristic, allowing us to rapidly process people, assign them roles, and then expectations for how they should and can act. They're learned. Children learn what it means to be male or female from the culture in which they live. They're descriptive. It reflects an expectation of how men and women are, and they're also prescriptive. It tells us how men and women should be acting. So this is a picture that one of my friends sent me. It was taken in a home store just a couple of months ago. So a boy is a superhero in disguise. They have super abilities, unbelievably competent, beyond competent. A girl is a giggle with glitter on it. Sounds pretty worthless to me. <laughs> but can you see the messages that we're starting to receive starting at a really young age? These add up and they make a huge difference. So gender schemas are largely based on expectations that arose from the primitive sex-based division of labor. So men were hunters. They were out having to conquer animals, kill things, being strong. They were swift. But women sustained the community. They cared for others. So accordingly, the male schema is characterized by what we call agentic. 
Agentic is a word that comes from the word agent, and it means that you're capable of independent, autonomous action, that you can exert actions that then affect the outcome of the environment around you. So you're instrumental, you're task-oriented, assertive, competent, and competitive. The female schema, on the other hand, is more communal, nurturing, empathic, compassionate, concerned about others, expressive. And the key to understanding schemas is that these are binary. If you fall into one category, you cannot have or possess the traits in the other. Of course, men and women both exhibit traits in both categories, but the key here is the stereotype. So these are prescriptive. Women are expected to engage in a feminine gender role and exhibit these traits. The same goes for men. You are expected to engage in a masculine, fam uh, masculine gender role and exhibit those traits. So you might be thinking, well, thank you for this lesson in theory, but we're a very smart group of modern thinking people and we just know that that's not true anymore. No. <laughs> So letters of recommendation are a really important selection tool. We use them to verify people's qualifications, and they're a key part of our promotional assessment. So using linguistic analysis, these gender schemas are clearly evident in reference letters that are written for medical students to get into residency, for residents applying for jobs, and then for medical school faculty who are applying for promotions. So men are described more often in agentic terms. They have a lot more standout descriptors. Those are things like saying accomplished, successful, achieved. They have, uh, the content focuses more on their achievements and there's many more references to direct activities that are listed in their CVs. There's more scientific terminology used in letters that are written for men. And on average, they're almost 20% longer than letters written for women. So for women, on the other hand, writers tend to use more communal descriptors. They're compassionate, they're warm, <laughs> they're kind, they're empathic. They take care of patients, they relate to families. Content focuses on effort instead of achievement. Women are hardworking, meticulous, detail-oriented. There are more references to women's personal lives, and professional and status titles are used four times less in letters written for women. There's been similar observations for NIH R01 reviewer critiques. So communal descriptors have been shown to have a negative hiring association, and that's because of the implied agentic deficit. If you are communal, then you cannot be competent. It's the implied deficit that women lack ability. So our implicit bias is revealed. So women's professional titles are used much less often. I just want to spend a moment to talk about this, and thank you, Brad, for making that emphasis. Dr. Anna Walt. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a pretty revealing study. This was out of the Mayo Clinic. They went back and reviewed three years' worth of their internal medicine grand rounds videos, and they looked at comparisons between the sex of the speaker and the sex of the introducer. And they found that when women were introducing other women or men, they used a professional title, which could be their actual status title or even just saying doctor, nearly 100% of the time. When men were introducing other men, they used a professional title about 75% of the time. And when men introduced women, 60% of the time. The effect is several fold. I think it highlights accomplished, it, there's a failure to highlight accomplishment, and then it strips away status. <clears throat> so if women buck gender norms and then try to behave agentically, engaging in behaviors like self-promotion that are critical to advancement, they're penalized for not fitting into their expected gender role. So agentic words for men become pejorative words for women. When men are bold, women are bossy. Men are assertive, women are pushy. If you're stoic, we're an ice queen. I'd like to read to you a quote from Amy Poehler. <laughs> she says, I just love bossy women. To me, bossy is not pejorative. It means somebody's passionate and engaging and ambitious, and they don't mind leading. 
So understanding this backlash effect can inform us about salary negotiations for women. So one of the hypotheses that is offered to explain that unexplainable gap is that women aren't asking. But asking for a woman does not mean that you're going to receive, and it can actually hurt you. So I've chosen what I think is a representative experiment here, and there's many more. Here, business school students were asked to evaluate the request of an event planner to cancel a hotel uh, that had already been paid for well after the cancellation policy. This was a written request, and the only reference to gender was a pronoun saying this event planner, he or she. Then these people were assigned two different titles. They were either, give, either given a title of junior officer or an executive leader. And what they found that for men in the dark gray bars, they were equally as likely to get a refund for that hotel room regardless of their status. But for women, that made all of the difference. Women who were given the title of junior officer were far less likely to get a refund. But if you carried the title of executive leader, you were very likely, and in fact, just as likely as a man to get that. I think this has major implications for us suggesting that we just need to train women on salary negotiations. I've also decided to change my name to executive chief resident. <laughs> So the key here is that not everything that is uh, faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So the key here is that we have to acknowledge our biases. That's the most powerful first step. So the bad news is that you can't change the bias, but we can mitigate its effects. So I want to share with you a randomized con controlled trial that was done at the University of Wisconsin across 96 different departments in their various schools, departments in medicine, science, and engineering. They were randomized to an intervention, a two and a half hour workshop that had three different modules, one focusing on introducing bias as a habit, some literacy, and then evidence-based cognitive behavioral training on how to mitigate its effects. So the effect sizes were relatively small, but I think very important. At three months after that one workshop, they had sustained reported increases in personal bias awareness, motivation to promote gender equity, and what I think is very revealing is that people who participated felt that they fit in better to their departments, that the individual work that they were doing was more highly valued, and they were felt more comfortable raising different family or personal responsibilities when considering scheduling within their department. So perceptions matter but so does action. So in those departments where at least 25% of faculty members participated in the intervention, there was a sustained self-reported increase in actions done to promote gender equity. So it supports that we need a critical mass to affect change. So what I offer to you is that a department-wide intervention can have very positive effects on reducing our bias with important benefits for everyone. But it requires a critical mass for buy-in. A rising tide can lift all boats. So what can you do? Test your own biases. I challenge you to take an implicit association test so you can recognize what's informing your actions. Review reference letters that you've written. Have you used titles appropriately? We should address men and women equally. So to summarize what I've spoken to you, to, to you today, I think that we need to really evaluate our expectation of how a career is expected to progress in medicine. We need to think creatively and innovatively about our promotional systems, how we value the different work that is done from different contributors. We also need to strive for a lattice approach for that flexibility. Sponsorship of women should become an organizational strategy. We should put it into deliberate practice, ensure the advancement of talented young women. And last, I think that we have to acknowledge that bias is unseen, but it's very real, and it affects us every day in all of our actions and our interactions. We can't change the bias, but we can change our awareness, and we can change the effects. It takes work. It requires the entire medicine community to mobilize to do this. I hope that we can all do that together, and I'm very excited to hear your individual thoughts. And I challenge you when you leave this room to continue this conversation. Tell me you agree. Tell me you disagree. I welcome it all.
So I want to thank a lot of people who uh, spent a lot of time talking to me, a lot of these issues. I couldn't have done it with any of your, without your support.